we're back with our final segment with Stephen Armstrong of Verse by Verse Ministry of San Antonio. Uh, I want to get this in now and get it in at the close. Uh, the website, what is, what is the address for the website? The website is versebyverseministry.org. And uh, make sure you stick the word ministry on there at the end. If you don't, you're going to end up at another site and uh, probably not the one you want to go to. Well, versebyverseministry.org. I assume Genesis is one of your more popular studies, one of your more popular mm -hmm. viewed studies online. But I've got to think that Revelation, your Revelation study, is your, is your most popular, most yep. viewed study. Yes, it is. Uh, I think you told me you're working on a book uh, you hope to have published regarding this study. Right. Um, what, what are some of the fruits you've seen from your Revelation study, and, and what are some of the things, or what, what attitudes inhibit people from studying Revelation? Well, probably two things primarily. Uh, first, the subject matter. It's not a book that um, affirms us. It's a book that, and, and really nothing in the Bible does if you get right, right down to it, but right. it's, it's a book that scares some people because the contents of the book reveal some very scary things and things that are planned for the earth and for the world to come. And uh, for the unbeliever or for the one who doesn't understand scripture in a deep way, these things are unnerving. So I think for many people it's you know, better not known for them. They, they think if they can just ignore it, they won't have to contend with it. Well, that's not a healthy perspective, but uh, it is common. And then I think the second reason people are sometimes uh, hesitant to study the book is that many people have done violence to it in the way they've tried to teach it. They have distorted it. They've mistaught it. They've made it appear as if it's impossible to understand. And uh, as a result, the concern is if I try to study this, I'll just end up more confused than I was when I started. So between the content and the way people have mishandled it, there's a lot of hesitation among Christians to study it, which is really a shame because uh, if you study it properly, it's uh, the most powerful book of the scriptures. It, it takes a lot of patience to study Revelation, I think. I, I think that confusion part hit me. I'm sure it hits a lot of people. I think yeah. it's something that we have to work through. Uh, well, what I tell people know. is if I go back to that novel uh, example that I used earlier, if I gave you a novel that was complex and and had a lot of twists and turns and had a lot of characters in it. And I gave you the book, you'd never read it. But then I asked you to read the last chapter of that novel first. How much of that last chapter do you think you would understand? How much of the, the goings on would make sense to you? Probably little or none because you wouldn't have had the other chapters of the book to help you and you wouldn't have understood the context or the history of anything. You would have just been dropping in at the very end. Well, going back to where we started in this interview, if the Bible is truly one integrated work written by one author, God himself, and it's designed to be understood from front to back, then if I drop in on the last chapter, so to speak, of the book, that is the book of Revelation, how much of that am I likely to understand? And then add to that the fact that it's written with an apocalyptic style. There's a lot of imagery there intended to shield or to obscure what it means from someone who is trying to come at it without God's spirit teaching them. In other words, it's designed to be understood only by the believer. So the, the nature of the problem is we go to that book without studying the rest of the Bible first. So yeah, it's gonna to be tough for someone who, who comes at it that way. But if we come at it with an understanding that it is the summing up of all that has happened before, and the completing of a plan God began earlier, then we're in a better position to understand it. So when I teach it, when we try to teach it for people, we spend an awful lot of time teaching things that are outside the book of Revelation in earlier books of the Bible to get you ready for what the Bible I, I think the book the, says. Well, maybe not the best thing, but certainly one of the best things about your Revelation study is the time that you spend in the other, uh, other books, right. which substantiates what you're teaching. Or explain and, and, it. And, explain and, it yeah, yeah. yeah, it explains it. And, it. and it becomes so much more clear in that method. And then uh, my benefit has been, too, is, is when you point back to something from Daniel or one of the prophets or Matthew and you begin to dig in, it encourages me to even study a few more chapters exactly. back from that to see, okay, what was the context that set this up? That's actually one of the things we hear most often from students. Whenever they, and this is not unique to Revelation. You, we do this same thing, as you know, when we teach other books of the Bible because, once again, no book of the Bible stands apart from the rest. So if I'm going to teach Revelation properly or if I'm going to teach Genesis properly, I have to be willing to show how this story in Genesis or elsewhere connects to the rest of the Bible. So when we do that, we hear most commonly from students that our teaching 
brings them to an, a different understanding of the Bible holistically. They start to see it as a single work. They start to recognize that as they study something in Jeremiah or something in the Gospels or something in Paul's letters, that there's going to be a thread there that they can find tracing to other books of the Bible. And it opens up the Bible for people. We had an interesting conversation here at the break, and, and we, were, we were talking about churches and church life, uh, the benefits of the Scripture. What does the Bible teach us about choosing a church, or what do we look for in churches? Uh, and, and I think, for me, it begins with the Bible is our ultimate authority. Absolutely. And if we're not willing to rest on it being our ultimate authority, then we can come up with whatever we want. Right. Well, so uh, wh where would you take it? It really begins with the word church. The word church. The, the idea of a church is not, it's not a building. Um, it's not a, an event. The ecclesia, is that the word for church? Ecclesia, it means the called out or the invited guests. The called out or the invited guest, okay. Right, and, and of course Christ is the one inviting. That's right. And uh, the guests then are those he has called into the body of Christ, into this gathering. But the church is not a building and church is not an event. So I don't go to church and I don't uh, have a church. I am the church, right. as is anyone else who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by faith, <clears throat> faith in Christ. And so church is not a spectator sport. It's an active sport. It's something we're to be involved in and contribute to and be a part of. But like any organization, uh, any group of people who come together, there's, there is some organizing principle. There is some foundational truth or set of principles that bind us together, that make us a group. For us, that is the Word of God. It's not our statement of faith. It's not our denomination. It's not... Where, I, where I, my dad took me to church or where I was baptized. It's, or where it's, we're going to have Sunday dinner. Or where we're going to have Sunday dinner. It's none right. of those things, right? It is about a group of people who have united around a set of beliefs or principles or truths. Where are those found? Well, in the Christian faith and in, in God's Word being that center, in the Christian faith it is the Scriptures. So if the Scripture is not front and center in the gathering, in the activities and the, and the work of, the, of that body, then we've ceased being the church. We're just another community club. We're just another social club. We're, we're just another gathering of people for some other purpose. And it's critical that a Christian be a part of this body. An active part of it. An active part of this body. And I believe in 1 John it talks about our fellowship. Through our fellowship, uh, the blood of Christ cleanses us. Right. It, it, as we are together. It, it's where we are exhorted and encouraged. Right. And you mentioned that we are invited guests that, that often... Uh, one of the things that pains me, one of the things I've had to grow through is that, that those attending with me or that, that those part of that body with me are invited guests just as much as I am. Right. We're yeah. not, we're, we, don't have a, um, we don't have an option, really. We've been called into this group and we are now obligated to participate in it in a full and, and meaningful way using the gifts God's given us and to contribute. I, I try to make an analogy when I, when I talk to people about the importance of being a participant in the gathering. I make an analogy to something that I think many people know in their, in their everyday life. If you play on a, an adult uh, softball league, or if, if you can remember back to days in high school or, or college when you were part of some sports team. Yeah, they team, had short shorts then when I played. When you, you played. You didn't have the long shorts. And I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I understand. The, the, the analogy I use is if you were on, a, let's say, an adult softball team, and you had an important position to play on that team, uh, when the games come up on the calendar, do you sit at home and say to yourself, you know, maybe I won't go to the game today. I don't feel like going today. What, what is there in it for me? I don't feel like going. No, if you're a team player, you're going to say, I've got to go. The team depends on me to be there. If I'm not there, then I let the team down and I'm not going to do that. Well, that's the mentality we're supposed to have about the church. You're not there as a spectator. You're there as a contributor. Whether you have a speaking role or whether you have some other service role or whether you're there just there to encourage the person sitting next to you or pray for the person in the hall. You're there to contribute in some meaningful way, spiritually. And if you sit at home on a Sunday or a Saturday night or whatever other day of the week you might gather and you don't participate because you don't see anything you're getting out of it, you're no different than that ball player that says, well, you know, I don't feel like going today. You're letting the team down. And I think it's interesting that we would not let our softball teams down, but we're very willing, unfortunately, to let our church family down by not being an active participant, by giving what we have to the body as God has allowed us to. And uh, that's our call. Why do we fall into that place? Why are so many Christians in that state of, of uh, I guess, lethargy as is, is, is part of, as is, is participating in the body? Well, it, there's probably two reasons that come to mind for me. One is 
one's in eternal, it's always been this way, and one is probably more given the days that we live in now. Uh, the first reason is that it's our natural fleshly instinct to be selfish, to be prideful, to do things only when we get something out of it for our own sake. And uh, if we can't find a way to feed our flesh, to feed our pride, then we lose interest. That's something that we're supposed to contend with. That's the self-sacrificial uh, call of the Christian. That's the, the essence of what Christ said when he asked that we would take up our cross and follow him, that we would sacrifice our needs for the sake of the glory of Christ and for the edification of those in the body of Christ, for our fellow Christians. You know, that's a foreign concept in church. We, we all come to church to, to get what we can get, or unfortunately right. many of us, to get what we can get out of it. And certainly there's teaching and there's feeding, there's right. fellowship that we do come to get. But, but ultimately, the Christian fe fellowship and uh, the Christian walk is based on self-sacrifice. Right. Well, if everyone's doing what they're supposed to do, you will get something out of it because you'll somebody have else somebody else is sacrificing Somebody else is sacrificing and, and serving you. Um, but it's just the nature of the flesh to, that we are supposed to contend with. The second answer is more, t I think, contemporary. I think in the age we live in now, and this is an age that Scripture itself predicted would come upon the earth. Absolutely. An age in which men would become prideful, self-seeking. Uh, and uh, selfish in all respects, that there would be an apostasy in the church over time, that the church would see a falling away of, of true believers and of a true manifestation of our faith. And in these last days, men become lovers of self, Paul says, and as a result, I think the church becomes weaker. Jesus and, makes a statement, the love of many will wax cold, I believe. Is that mm -hmm. sort of playing in, into that? In that yeah, and, and that's, that's speaking in Matthew 24. He's, he's really alluding to the very last days, even in tribulation, which is a period of time coming on the earth uh, immediately before Christ's return. Uh, I think Paul, in his writing, particularly to the church in Thessalonica, he indicates that that waning, or that, that, that uh, diminished love and diminished service begins even before that tribulation period ensues. And that's the time I think we're living in now. And what's, what's interesting is he talks about this coming, this period. He gives his protege, Timothy, a pastor that, right, sure. that, that he raised, taught, and, and, and discipled. He gives Timothy the instructions for how the church is to combat this lethargy, this falling away. And the w advice he gives Timothy is preach the word. So in the, season or out of season. In right. season, out of season, meaning whether they like it or not. Because tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. The antidote to what we're experiencing in the church is more men in the pulpit teaching the Bible. So I would tell anyone listening that if they're in a church in which the Bible is not front and center, and I don't mean that it has to be done verse by verse, but if the Bible is not the core of the teaching and the principles that unite. The ultimate authority. The ultimate authority, the purpose of the gathering centered on the Word, then um, it probably behooves that person to think twice about where they spend their time on Sundays because th that is not a, a fruitful experience if it's not centered in the Word of God.